All right. Well, last week we learned that uh, it took an invasion of the nation of Israel before Saul would actually do his job. <laughs> and that's kind of where we left off there last week. And David goes to the wilderness of En Gedi. And that's where we're going to pick up the story here in a minute. Uh, in a minute. Now, I titled the sermon this evening, The Cautions of Your Conscience. The Cautions of Your Conscience. And we're going to, uh, well, I'm going to explain what that means here in a moment. Now, don't ever get so wrapped up into these stories where you're just like, you know what, again, David's on the run. What am I going to learn? This is boring. You know, it's the same story every week because it's not. These things are, I mean, the Bible is a very, very deep book. You know, there's so much doctrine. You know, this is a short chapter and we're not even going to be able to go in depth over every single doctrine in here. It's crazy. You know, leave that for the Neo Geo Christians. All right. Look at verse number one. It says this, and it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. So, of course, the Bible takes us right back to the mentality that Saul has. You know, he's, he's like, okay, well, our nation's being invaded. I'm expected to go fight and defend. So he goes, follows the Philistines, does what he has to do with them. And the moment there's a break, what does he do? Does he go visit his family? <laughs> go read some stories to the kids? Go try to edify somebody? Go fishing? No, he wants to kill David, the person who has done absolutely nothing wrong to him. He just cannot cease from this objective. This guy is literally obsessed with killing David, and he's not going to let this go. And that's what you're seeing here in verse number one. Now, what else do you notice when you read this verse? There's always somebody watching, isn't there? Look, David's just like, okay, well, I'm going to go out here in the wilderness where there's mountain goats and, you know, it's kind of rougher terrain, and people are still dropping dimes. You know, you got this drove of dime droppers that's always following David. And what that tells me is what you already know. And that is anytime you do something great for God, guess what? The negativity will always be there every single time. You know, what did he do in the previous chapter? Well, David went and he inquired of the Lord, should I go and fight with the Philistines? I got my men here, but they're scared. I, you know, I just want to ask for clarification. I'm not sure. God says, go do it. I will be with you. He does it. He's successful. He's also successful at avoiding Saul. God's on his side. But yet, nonetheless, the haters are still there. Right? You have to understand this. This is throughout the entire Bible. Anytime you do something, God, any, you just do something good at work that has nothing to do with Christianity, you're going to have haters. That's just life. That is how human behavior is. Now look at verse number two. It says, Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So this is not an easy task, right? If you were to go play around up here in the hills, uh, it's fun for a little while. But if you were told, hey, you need to stay up there and figure out your food and water for a couple weeks or, you know, a couple months, you would be starting to panic. <laughs> Especially this, you know, us today, because we don't live in the wilderness. We're not used to that sort of uh, lifestyle there. But Saul chooses 3,000 warriors. How many does David have? 600, right? That's what we learned in the previous chapter. And so look, what does that tell you? Saul really, 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 really wants to get this job done. He wants to kill David. And he's like, look, I just can't leave anything to chance. I'm going to get the best guys. 3,000 of them. That ought to do it. Look at verse 3. Uh, it says this, and he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave and Saul went in to cover his feet and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Now the Bible doesn't specifically tell you this, but you have to think about this. What are the odds, right? David and his men are hiding in caves, they're in the mountains. And what are the odds that Saul happens to walk into the same cave that David's in? Who do you think orchestrated that? Obviously God, obviously he is on David's side. And this is just telling us that fact there. Now I've had Bible teachers say, well, um, Saul went in there uh, to cover his feet, meaning he took a nap. So he laid down and threw a blanket over himself. And so therefore he covered his feet. Okay. That's not what's going on. This guy, this is a euphemism for using the bathroom. Okay. The Bible doesn't get graphic all the time and tell us every little detail about stuff like that. We don't need to know. Okay. So it's very careful just saying, hey, Saul, it's, it's his time to go. And it just so happens to be where David and his men are. Now, if you think about this, you're hiding in a cave where there's no light. Your eyes are going to be adjusted to the darkness uh, that would be inside of this cave. Well, Saul probably walks in here, has no idea what's going on. 
can't smell anybody, can't hear anybody in there because these guys are being quiet. But their eyes, I would imagine, have been adjusted to this. And so they recognize him. And they're like, ooh, wait a second. God's delivered Saul into the hand of David. Look at verse 4. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. Okay, do you see what's going on here? The first thing I want to bring up is this. You have to be careful when other people become your prophet. Right? When somebody just, you know, shows up in your life, you know, a situation happens to you, you're like, you know what, I've been praying for this situation here. I've been praying for this certain outcome. And other people say, hey, well, actually, this is it right here. Right? And they're saying, this is from God. You need to be careful with that. And you're going to see David actually, what does he do? He goes and he actually picks up Saul's robe and cuts off the skirt of that robe. And that just means edge, right? So like my coat here, right? If I were to cut this whole edge off all the way around it, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about the, the, the fringes of his garment. I've heard pastors say that he was wearing a skirt. And they'll say, see, this proves it. Even, you know, back in the old time, I know you guys want to judge people who wear skirts today. You, know, you want to judge guys who wear skirts and stuff like that in the Middle East. But that, they've been wearing them for thousands of years. And they would try to use this as a proof text. Look, a robe and an actual skirt are two different garments. They're not the same thing. It says robe, skirt of his robe. Now, I've been guilty before of, you know, being in a hurry for a sermon. And sometimes, you know, I'll type in a word that's got... You know, like it's got, it comes with 50 verses in it, right? And I'll, I'll be looking through that, like, oh, that sounds good. And I'll put it in the sermon later on. I'm like, oh, crap, that's not really what that meant. Darn it. I have been guilty of doing that myself, right? But that, you know, lack of preparation, that lack of actually reading the passage thoroughly is what gets people into trouble. And you would have, I mean, if you're a pastor, you know, you, you, you hope you wouldn't make that mistake. Hopefully you would have at least read a couple verses back. Because even when I do that, I try to read at least a few verses. Now I don't do that anymore. I actually, I go back and I read the whole chapter and, you know, to, to try to avoid making those types of mistakes. But I heard this guy saying, you know, what kind of man was Saul during this time wearing a skirt? Well, what are you trying to say that he's a transvestite? Look, Saul at his worst state is better than any tranny. Okay, <laughs> give me a break. So that is not what it's talking about. It's clearly talking about his robe. Obviously, he's a king. He has royal attire. Not hard for us to understand, is it? Now, of course, the modern versions like to, to play around with this. And I was looking through some of them. New King James, I think it says that, that David cut off the corner of his skirt. The NIV said uh, cut off the corner of his, uh, of his robe. A couple of the other ones say just cut off uh, a chunk of his skirt. I think the Amplified Bible is the only one that didn't change it, and that's a, a piece of junk anyways. So I use eSword to cut and paste from. I just think it's easy. Sometimes I type notes in there and, and whatnot. I said, you know what? I just want to see what the little Strong's Concordance says when I click on the word skirt. And it says this. It says an edge or extremity specifically of a bird or army, a wing of a garment or bed, uh, clothing, a flap, a quarter, of a building, a pinnacle, plus bird, border, corner, and feather, you know, and it just goes on to list all these different words, right? This, this thing's like this long of just, you know, font, just different words just blasted out there. Do you see why you need to have people that thoroughly, fully, completely understand language that are going to translate the Bible? See, that's what you have with the King James, but you don't really have that with a lot of these other ones. You have posers, people who think that they know the language. There is a big difference. You see, I could make the Bible say whatever I want to if I were to consistently go back and say, well, in the Hebrew, it really means wing. So Saul's robe like stuck out like angel's wings because he thought he was an angel. Right? I could say stuff like that. And there are people in this town that would believe it. Wholeheartedly. Or I guess I could say, well, uh, so it says edge, extremity, specifically of a bird. Uh, or an, uh, an army wing, right? Like a division. You know, like the Air Force has different wings, which means like a, a group, a, a, like, a, like I would say a platoon. You know, what wing are you in? What detachment are you of? Okay, and somebody could say, well, actually what David did is he went out and he actually did cut off part of David's wing. <laughs> <laughs> okay? I, that's what the original language says. And guess what? Most people today who call themselves Christians would believe it. 
You say, well, how do you know that? Because we talk to these people every single week, every single week. Start to ask them about these stories in the Bible, and they have zero clue. They have no clue. You know, Moses, you know how we talked this morning? We talked about Gideon. We talked about Jephthah. We talked about King Amaziah. You know, most people, when they do their Sunday school lessons, all they hear about Gideon is about the fleece. That's it. They have no idea what Gideon really did after that interaction with, uh, with Ephraim about how he went back and he beat those guys down and drug them through the sticker bushes and said, I'll teach you a lesson. Doesn't make very good for your non-judgmental, all-inclusive, uh, brainwashing, new evangelical Christianity, does it? Right. And by the way, what's up with these benches out here that say, be, you know, don't be afraid. Be not afraid. Anybody seen that? They're all over town. Just yellow background, black letters. This has nothing to do with the sermon, really. But it just says, be not afraid or something like that. Is that what it says? Yeah, be not afraid. You know, I feel like that's the message that's being pushed on us, even by a lot of these churches around here. And it's sickening, right? Don't be afraid of what's coming. You know, you ought to be afraid of what's coming. You ought to develop some fear, right, of the false teachings and the garbage that's going on out there and have some motivation to go out and get some people saved and turn their minds back to God. Be not afraid. No, this is the time to be afraid for certain people, people who are not saved, people who are not on fire for God. Because you know what? There are people that do this every single day. They'll click on a word. Oh, in the Hebrew, it means wing. And they'll just come up with these crazy stories. Absolutely disgusting, but it happens all the time. And you know what? We need to put a stop to that. We all need to hate stuff like that. That's why I bring it up all the time. Nothing's more frustrating than when you're reading somebody Ephesians 2, 8, 9 at the door. And they're like, well, actually, if you go back to the original languages, that's not what it means. Right. You know what? If you want to stay on probation, pal, then you go right ahead. Right. You go ahead and keep working for your salvation. And let me know how that turns out when you swan dive into hell. Yeah, that's right. So done with that commercial break here. Let me get back on track here. So verse number five, it says, and it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. This is very important here to the sermon. Now, I just want to say this too. I think that kind of prophetically, or uh, if, if you were to look at this, so get the picture here. Saul's got to use the restroom. He's got to, he's got to go inside of this cave, right? He takes off his royal robe, leaves it aside. David sneaks up there, cuts off the skirt, right? That's what it says. He says he cut off the skirt of his robe, the entire thing. Not a portion of it like the NIV wants to say. Not a portion of it like the New King James wants to say. He cut off the entire thing. Well, what happens when he puts that thing on, when Saul puts that, that robe back on? Well, it goes all the way around him. I believe that that's symbolic that David is going to be all around the kingdom, that he's soon about to take over. You can have different opinions on that. It's just kind of what I was thinking about. You know, because a lot of times I'm like, why, why is this in the Bible? And I just sit there and I just think and I write stuff down. And I don't know, I was just kind of thinking about that because that's exactly what plays out. Now, let's see here. Look at verse number six. So David's heart smites him. Right? He's having this wrestling match with his conscience. And who's ever had that before? Of course, all of us had, right? You're going to see the results of that here. Look at verse 6. It says this, And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Now, tell me that that doesn't take maturity. Tell me that that doesn't take a heart after God's own heart to say something like that, to actually do that. You see, because a lot of times we get these wrestling matches with ourselves. You know, we start to reason with ourselves. Well, I could just do it this one time. Nobody's going to know. It's not that big of a deal. Right? And, and a lot of times what winds up happening, we self-destruct. We self-destruct. And guess what? David's got everything working against him here, even though it doesn't seem like that. Right? He's got the perfect scenario. Right? He's been on the run. They're hungry. They're frustrated. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. All of his men are like scared. You know, they're just like, what are we going to do here? All of a sudden, it seems like God's delivering up the perfect scenario. And he's got all his guys saying, David, this is your chance. And he could be wrestling with himself saying, you know what? If I don't do this, I'm going to lose the respect of all of these guys. I'm sure all these things had to play in his mind. Right? But his conscience... The law that's written on his heart says otherwise. And he stops for a second and he realizes that. I think we'd save ourselves a lot of trouble in life if we often just stopped and kind of listened to that little nudge. Right? Remember we talked about that this morning when somebody calls you out on your stuff, on your business, and it digs at you 
and you know it's true instead of just making stuff up and you know trying to circumvent that we just acknowledge it you know what we'd often have better lives if we did that sort of stuff and that's exactly what you're going to see here so he says and he said unto his man the lord forbid that i should do this thing unto my master the lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him seeing that he is the anointed of the lord so obviously the Bible's telling us there that David understands the proper thing to do here. He realized, you know what? God has not installed me as king yet. So this cannot be the answer to our prayers. It cannot play out like this. Verse seven. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. I guess some would say, well, he woke up from his nap and <laughs> walked out of his way, but that's not the case. It says, David stayed his servants with these words. So David is now beginning to teach proper doctrine to his people, something, again, that is lacking in today's professing Christianity. So he stays his servants. He stops them. Keep your place there, obviously. Go to Romans chapter number 2. Romans chapter number 2. I use this passage here when I went to Cincinnati and I, I, I preached that sermon called Quicksand Baptist. And I was talking about how, you know, avoiding self-destruction a lot of times, it depends on us being cautious of our conscience because your, your conscience is going to give you warnings. It's going to give you cautions. Hey, don't say that, right? Don't say that to your wife. <laughs> don't say that to your mom. Don't say that to your dad. You know, do the whole thing, right? Kids, your parents tell you to sweep the kitchen and you're like, well, there's, it's more of a, of a mess over here than it is over here. If I just, you know, clean up this one mess over here, it's going to look better. So I think we can get away with that. I know it's called being a minimite, <laughs> a minimalist in a bad way, right? We're not talking about these preppers and these people that like to live without minimum comforts. I'm talking about a minimalist, somebody who always just wants to get by with doing the absolute minimum. Don't tell me that you don't wrestle with what you were told because we do. We all do this. It all, especially you see it a lot in the young ones, and this has to be driven out of them. So uh, real quickly, look at verse 14, Romans 2, look at verse 14. It says this, so Paul's telling the Romans, says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So the very fact that people automatically know that it's wrong to steal and to kill and to do all of these things, the fact that they know that and they choose you know, to operate in that way, they're a proof unto themselves that God has written his law in their hearts and that there is a God. So verse 15 says this, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number one. 1 Timothy chapter number one. And so with that, I'd say that David definitely had the faith that God would solve his problem, that he would remedy his situation between him, his man, and Saul and the rest of Israel in the proper time, right? And how did this thing start? He had that pricking of his conscience. That's how this thing started. And, and what David did is he stopped and he thought about it for a moment. He said, why did my heart smite me when I just did this little prank and cut off his, you know, the edge, the skirt of his garment? Right? That's a wise thing to do, to stop and listen to that. Why does this hurt me? Why does this prick me? And so by doing that, you will make better decisions. But if you look at verse number 18, 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul tells Timothy this. He says, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And of course, this is why you're in church this evening. This is why you come to church. This is why you read the Bible, why you love God, why you serve God is to war a good warfare. That's David's goal as well. Look at verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. You can go back to 1 Samuel chapter number 24. So all I'm trying to tell you is that when we say, you know what? Yeah, I've got faith, right? Everybody tells us at the door they've got faith, even the Mormons. Even the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? the Catholic, they all do. The Buddhists, oh, I've got faith. Right? But they've got faith in the wrong thing, right? And their conscience, which I believe is telling them, hey, this is wrong. Right? I believe when you read that Bible to somebody and they say they don't believe it, I believe it still pricks their heart because it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. And it gets down to the thoughts and the intents of their heart. Right? What usually happens? They wind up neglecting it. They squash that conscience. They squash that little message that's trying to tell them, hey, this is the truth. 
you need to let go of that pride and you need to get saved. You need to do the right thing here. They let go of that. What winds up happening? They make shipwreck of their lives. You're making a shipwreck of your, of your entire eternity. All because you wanted to hang on to that human achievement religion. Right? But you know what? The same thing happens to us. When we've got the faith, we're saved. We're born again. We're not going anywhere. We're not losing our salvation. But yet we say, you know what? I don't want to listen to that right now because that's going contrary to the way that I want to live and I want to do business. Guess what? We make a shipwreck of our lives, don't we? And David is in a very volatile situation here to where if he listens to his men, listens to the pressure, he's going to shipwreck his own life. In fact, he does that later on in his life, doesn't he? So let's move on here. Look at verse number eight. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul saying, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. I wish I could have seen the look on Saul's face when he heard that. Cause it had to just like play back in his mind. Like, wait a minute. I hear that voice. I was just in that cave. Look at verse nine. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. So David is still very respectful here, talking to a guy who has been hunting him for a very, very long time. Remember, this is the same Saul that casted, uh, the same Saul that casted javelin at David, right? And he didn't hold on to that bitterness, did he? Look at verse ten. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand. In the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. That's a picture of extreme humility right there. Verse 11. Moreover, my father, see, yea, this, or see the skirt of thy robe in mine hand? For in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe, and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. Now notice how he's talking to Saul here, my father, right? We're going to talk about that here because Saul's going to respond in the same way in a moment. Verse 12, the Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee thee. And so he's basically very gently, very politely being tired, being away from his comforts, being away from his family, being away from everything that he's uh, accustomed to. You know, he's not blaming him. He's not sitting there like, you stinking reprobate. I've been out here trying to chase these mountain goats and get water and drink this milk. It's just not working out. No, he's just telling him, hey, what is going on with you, Saul? Why are you trying to kill me? Why are you listening to all these other people? I'd be furious. I'd be absolutely crazy. In fact, I would probably, knowing me, I'd probably go to these people that uh, told on me for being in Engedi and be like, you know what? I'm going to pull a Gideon on you, and I'm going to drag you through the stick of bushes, and I'm going to come back and beat your entire city down. <laughs> but look at verse 13. It says, As saith the proverb of the ancients, Wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. And that's something that we have to really understand, especially as we see this world just going, it's literally like plummeting down. You know, the Bible talks about how the end times will be like it was in the days of Noah. And you can kind of see, well, by that statement here, there must have been a lot of sodomites in, you know, Noah's day. Must have been a lot of trannies, must have been a lot of lies and deception and everything that you're seeing today. Obviously different because they didn't have the same technology. But, you know, as we see this stuff approaching, we need to realize that God's going to destroy these wicked people. Right? We should never, you know, and sometimes you may want to, but we should never get this attitude like, you know, we got to actually take up arms and go physically fight the government. You won't win. You'll never win. But you got these types of people, and oftentimes they like to come into churches like ours and try to stir people up. You got to be careful because the CIA does the same thing. And so does the FBI. They like to come into churches and see who they can get riled up and then make an arrest and put you in the news. And next thing you know, all the work that we could have done for Christ right out the window. It happens. You can look it up. It happens all the time. This will be no exception. Right? And so we just have to realize God is going to punish the evildoers. He's going to punish all these wicked people. All this crazy stuff that Joe Biden's doing, guess what? He is going to roast. He is going to roast along with the rest of them. 
Bill Gates is going to be up to his neck in soy beef and flames, I believe, you know? <laughs> Verse 14 says this, After who is the king of Israel? Come out. After whom dost thou pursue? After a, dead, uh, after a dead dog? After a flea? So you see how he views himself? So who's really in control here? Like we talked about this morning. It's not Saul. Saul is not in control of himself. He may be the king. He might have 3,000 guys. But David's the one that is actually able to control how he feels in these terrible circumstances. And this is why we have to be a people that don't take things personally, just like I talked about this morning. He's not taking this personally. He realized Saul's got a problem, and God's going to have to sort it out. Verse 15, The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. And it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking those words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Real quickly, turn to Luke chapter number 3. Luke chapter number 3. And so you're going you're gonna to see a shift here in Saul's attitude towards David, all because of the wise way that he decided to respond to Saul. Now, unfortunately, it's going to be short-lived because in chapter 26, Saul's going to say, you know what, I need to go back after David and continue to hunt him. But he says, I know I'm going to take chapter 25 off. And of course, just <laughs> so Luke 3, 23, I want you to read this here. It says this. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now you get people like Storm, right? Most of you remember Storm who came in here and he wanted to argue about all these genealogies and stuff like that. You know, there are people out there that will, that will use this verse here in Luke chapter 3 as a point of contention to basically turn around and say, see, the Bible does say that Joseph was just, or I'm sorry, that Jesus was just the son of Joseph. Completely ignored the part there about supposing. Well, a proof text for that is the exchange that we just read in 1 Samuel 24. Because David, being the son-in-law to Saul, refers to him as what? My father. How does Saul respond to David? My son. So I'm just trying to tell you that in, even in those times, it wasn't uncommon to use that language. So you could just tell somebody like, you know what, just because he says it's the son of Joseph here and you want to ignore that as we're supposed, like your Bible apparently doesn't have that in there. You know, that doesn't mean that he was the physical, biological son of Joseph. That's blasphemy. He's the son of God. You know, you need to learn your Bible doctrine. But first Peter, go to first Peter chapter two, first Peter chapter number two. I just want to show you that that first Samuel 24, a good place to go to to show people that even the in-law position can still be referred by as uh, son, father, and the such. So 1 Peter chapter 2, um, look at verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 13. And you're going to see that David actually, he follows this wisdom here. Uh, it says this, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Now, here's the thing. David is in submission here, even though he's on the run. right? But you have to learn how to rightly divide the word. right? Because Saul's saying, David, come here so I can kill you. right? Stay still so I can hit you with his javelin. So does David have the right to avoid that and disobey that? Of course he does, because that's ungodly. That's unbiblical. And see, we as a nation, we're transitioning into a period like this. where We're having people that kind of are like Saul, right? And they're starting to push all sorts of agendas. For example, they want to come out with this gender inclusive garbage, right? They want to say, you know what, at your job place, if you run into a customer that's a man, looks like a man, but he wants to be called a she or a man, that you have to abide by that. But here's the thing, you can't do that. You know, and don't ever let somebody bring these verses up. Well, the government says you have to do it, so you better just do it. Yeah. No, that's sin. Yeah. They are molesting your mind. Right. They are literally controlling how you operate, and you cannot let them do that. Yeah. You say, well, what if I lose my job? Good. Hey, like we learned this morning about Amaziah, God is able to give thee much more than a job. Amen. He is able to meet your needs. So don't let these people do that. Because the government of today is going to push this so hard. Look, you can already see it by the people that are being appointed, if you will, to, to political positions. Right? This whole tranny thing, I mean, it's just blowing up everywhere. Yeah. There's an explosion of faggots everywhere, and you can see that all over town, even here now. Yeah. It's like I'm seeing them every week now. It's insane. Yeah. 
And it's like, how long have you been here? A couple weeks. <laughs> so go to their houses sometime. Just, just, what was it, last week? No joke. Walk in this house, right? And I'm like, all right, where's the dishwasher at? This girl's just laughing. I'm like, man, what the hell's going on here? Whatever. You know, I just got to get out of here. Big old goat right on the fridge. I was like, no way. Right, so I'm like, wait a second. I'll look for the coffee pot. I'm like, okay. Hmm. Oh, wait. Big pictures of booze all over the wall. Like they have like a, these people like have an altar. Not all of them, but right? they've got like this altar. Jeff knows what I'm talking about. A lot of people in their homes they got like this big altar, man, like this, just full of booze. I'm like, dude, that stuff looks expensive. Yeah. It's got to cost some money. And these people, I mean, I'm like, okay, man, what's up? Sure enough, in comes a super dyke. <laughs> I'm like, man. The booze and the goats. <laughs> Look, I don't know what it is. They, there's, it's almost like God's like, you know, putting that on them so they can signal us. Yeah. So be careful when you see people obsessing about goats. Now, look, there's farmers and stuff that are around here. A lot of farmers, and they've got pictures of their animals and stuff on them. You know, so don't walk into, like, you know, some milk dairy place and be like, oh, you guys got some things in here. You got goats on the wall. Right? But, you know, when you're in a subdivision, yeah. right, you know, you're in one of these subdivisions off Lake Hazel and Five Mile. You know, there ain't no farms around, right? There's an HOA that surely wouldn't let you have a goat. And they, and they always like the one with the big horns on them, you know, because that's close to their bathroom at their God, yeah. right? Just know you're in for a rough ride. <laughs> you're in for some trouble. But this stuff is just creeping up everywhere, everywhere. And the government wants to control how we speak. Hey, don't use he, she anymore when you type your notes. Okay, you got to use. No, I'm not, look, I'm not learning to speak another language. Yeah. I already have to learn how to speak new evangelical to the people out here so we can win them to Christ. I already have to learn how to speak, um, you know, in dollar signs to customers to try to get them to fix some stuff, whatever, you know. Uh, you know, we, we speak, you know, the, the, the language of the Bible here, you know, God's word. And then we got our own little goofy language we all talk to each other with after church. I'm not learning some tranny language. Not going to happen, dude. You can take that and shove it, man. It's not for me. I'm too old to learn that. You're all too old to learn that, and you know it. I don't care if you're three years old. Don't ever learn that language. Man means man. Hey, there's male and female, man. Two genders, and that's it. And if anybody's trying to bless you, no, you call him her. No, dude. I'm not doing it. Look, I've already been in that situation. I told you guys what happened to me down in uh, California. I was working for Geek Squad, installing a dishwasher. This two dudes answer the door. And the guy on the phone, you know, I'm talking, to the, I'm talking to their landlord. And he says, hey, put her back on the phone. I said, oh, there's no her here. And the guy's like, and I could tell what's going on because they got a sod flag bigger than this banner. No joke, no joke. And he's like, no, he's talking about me. I was like, no, he's looking for a girl. Right, and the manager's like, this manager, like he's like full Middle, Middle Eastern. I think he's from like Jordan. So real dark complexion, he's red. This dude is red. Right. So we do the job. I go outside. He's like, dude, you're a liability. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, look, I'm not going to let these people tell me how to look and see reality. Are you crazy? Yeah. He's like, well, I don't like it either, man, but we got to do something. I was like, I ain't calling them what they want. This is, I call them fags. He's just like, <laughs> you know, he thought that was funny. Right. He's like, secret. Like, <laughs> anyway, well, just, just be cool, man. Right. Just, just be careful. All right. Just, just don't get me into trouble. Don't worry. I'll get myself into enough trouble. <laughs> Anybody know what verse I was on here? What's Second Peter or First Peter? Oh yeah, let's start, let's let's look at verse fifteen. That looks good. All right, actually, let's look at verse fourteen. It says, "Warn to governors as to them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well." Unfortunately, that is being flipped today, and our government is no longer punishing evildoers; they're enabling evildoers, right? And so we have to learn how to function in that. And you can learn how David functions, how he operates. He's still using wisdom, and he's still able to come out on top despite that fact. Verse 15, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And that's exactly what David does in this moment here, isn't it? He literally puts Saul to silence. For the, I mean, the only other thing that got Saul to stop chasing David was the invasion of the Philistines. Yeah. <laughs> Not even just the little skirmish that David dealt with, but the full-on invasion here. Well, look at verse 16. It says, As free, and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Now, go back to 1 Samuel, and we'll uh, get ready to finish this up here. So, obviously, God's law always supersedes what the government says. You know, don't let them tell you, hey, you have to uh, respect these minor attracted persons. No, we're going to teach these politicians that they need to burn them. Amen. They need to remove them from society. Right. 
There's no such thing. I'm a minor. Yeah, no, they're pedophiles. Right. right? That's strange flesh. It is not natural to lust after little children. Right. You disgusting, puke piece of crap. Yeah. Right. Joe Biden is a puke. Yeah. He is disgusting. And I believe he's a pedophile. A hundred percent, I believe that. And the way we're going to fight that is not do what they say. I don't, you know, your, your whole office, your whole cabinet, your whole administration hates God right. with a passion. Yeah. And you know what? Everything that they dream up and that they think about, we have to be wise and circumvent it no matter what the cost. Right. Verse 17, we're going to see the result here of David following the wisdom that God has given him. So in verse 17, Saul further says this, and he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee for evil. So see, this is why I believe that Saul's not a reprobate. Because a reprobate is somebody who's been rejected by God, who has had their conscience seared, and they can't have a moment like this. Right? Because right? there are people out there, and then they'll say, well, you know, Saul was just, you know, he was just rejected by God and he didn't, you know, he went to Abraham's bosom. This is just this garbage stuff. But here he actually has a moment of clarity. You know, what makes him have this moment of clarity? It's the wisdom that David uses on him. He says, hey, look, I had the opportunity to kill you. I had the back of my men. But we're out in the middle of nowhere here. No one would have known. Because my guess is that if David wanted to, him and his men would have mopped those 3,000 guys. That's what I think. But he says, no. You know what, Saul? I'm not going to let you own me. I'm not going to let you control me. You might have me in tribulation. You might have me in the wilderness. You might have me running, but I am still going to find joy, and I'm still going to worship God, and I'm still going to have a good day. Verse 18, so Saul says this, And thou hast showed this day how that thou hast dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killest me not. So look at this. What a change in attitude this guy has had. And like I said, you're going to see this is very short-lived. Verse 19. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good, for that thou hast done unto me this day. It'd be kind of cool to go to heaven and see them joking around now. You know, because like I said, I, I believe Saul's say You're probably like, sorry, David, man. You know, <laughs> I, I lost. You know, I lost my cool. Whatever. You know, because like I said, you know, we go to heaven, you know, we're awaiting that new body. You know, that old flesh is dead. That's not going up there. So you're not going to have those same angry, bitter feelings. So David's probably looking at him just laughing. And Saul's like, man, eh, what are you going to do? Right? <laughs> no, verse 20. And now behold, I know well. And this is very important here. And now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. But notice he says, I know well. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, for the whole reason, going all the way back several chapters, you know, when David killed Goliath and he said, whose son is the stripling? Mm -hmm. Right. And remember how he started to inquire like, and people say, well, see, that's a contradiction in the Bible because it said in the chapters before that David, you know, was his armor bearer and he played music for him. And now the Bible saying he doesn't know who he is. It's like, no, he's inquiring of his father because he wants to know what tribe he's from because he understands the prophecy. Samuel had already told him, guess what, Saul, buddy, you're done. God is, dis is just d disgusted with you, right? And what does he say here? He's having this moment of clarity. He says, I know well, I know well that thou shalt surely be king. Saul knows this. Now, unfortunately, he's right. He knows it all too well, and he's going to continue to pursue. But verse 21, it's funny how he says this, Swear now, therefore, unto me by the Lord, that thou will not cut off my seed after me, and that thou will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swear unto Saul. And Saul went home, but David and his men got them up unto the hold. So David knows, right? David's already been down this, this road here. He knows he can't fully trust him, even though he's having this moment of clarity. He understands the severity of Saul's mental state. And he's like, you know, we just can't trust him. But it's kind of funny. David doesn't say, hey, swear to me that you're going to stop killing, trying to kill me. Right. Swear to me that I can go back and, you know, we can work together again until it's my turn, until God, you know, installs me as king. He doesn't do that because he knows that Saul's just going to turn around and try to stick another javelin through his heart or whatever the case is. And so next week, yeah, next weekend we'll be in chapter 25. And so the story's going to change a little bit. We get a little bit of a break. We'll learn about Nabal and his uh, soon to be stony heart. <laughs> 
longer chapter. So if you get a chance, read that whole chapter next week, and it'll all come together, hopefully, uh, even better. But uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, uh, for allowing us to be able to continuously uh, preach these stories in the Bible, Lord. I just pray that uh, they would always be... Uh, able to help us and uh, to glean application and to always uh, just keep abounding forward, Lord, and to teach these things to those that don't know and that are interested, Lord. And we thank you again for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.